again, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm just going to share my screen quick so we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so tonight's program, I will pronounce it for you, is Kukia, Cookie or Cookie, A History of American Christmas Cookies. Some of you have been sharing your favorite Christmas cookies in the chat. If you're just joining us, feel free to add those. We can we can discuss them at the end. Um, I'm not going to cover every possible Christmas cookie in this talk tonight because that would be a very, very long talk, but we are going to talk a lot about some of the most um, common and most popular ones and their origins. So I thought we would start a little bit with cookies in general. Where do cookies come from, right? So they're kind of ancestors in our ancient world food ways is unleavened hard breads, right? So they're crisp, um, flour-based foods, flatbreads, hardtack is probably a more modern antecedent, um, but they, they don't contain yeast or any kind of chemical leaven or anything. Um, and in this period, they're unsweetened largely. Um, around 700 CE, right, that's common era, uh, the Persians start a trade relationship with India, which is where uh, sugarcane is indigenous to. And they're the first ones to bring um, sugar to Europe and the Mediterranean. They're also the first to add sugar to their unleavened hard bread. So that's kind of our, our ancestor type of cookies. Um, cookies really start to become popular in the medieval period in Europe, in large part because of the Moorish invasion of Spain, and also to a lesser extent, the Crusades, right? So Europeans are traveling to the Middle East, to the Arab world. They're bringing back medicine and mathematics and all this kind of lost information from Rome and Greece um, and also food ways. And cookies are definitely one of the things uh, that come to Europe through that way, but also primarily through Spain. Um, they also bring a number of flavors that were not necessarily present in Europe prior to this time. In particular, ginger, black pepper, uh, cinnamon, and saffron are all coming on the Silk Road from India, from China, who also have trade relationships with the Spice Islands. So they're coming overland. They're also introducing cooking with wine, cooking with um, kind of Mediterranean fruits and nuts like almonds, and then also using some more uh, indigenous flavorings like honey, anise, caraway, things that are more native to continental Europe. So cookies kind of start in the medieval period, but they don't really get super popular until the 16th century for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which is that we start to have much more um, access to sugar because the, the 1500s are when we start to establish um, sugar plantations in the Caribbean and also when Europe starts to engage in the slave trade. So sugar, which had previously been extraordinarily expensive and was used much more like we would use salt or spices in the period becomes much cheaper and more widely accessible because of the slave trade. We also have Europeans um, like the Dutch kind of like bypassing the, the longstanding trade agreement between you know, Arab and Asian traders and basically just taking control of a lot of the Spice Islands by force. Um, so that is really part of the whole nutmeg craze in this time period. Um, the kind of so-called age of exploration, right, is a lot of that is really driving, um, being driven by the spice trade and trying to find shortcuts to Asia or ways around the um, Spanish and Portuguese domination of the water routes, um, and also the Viennese and Mediterranean, you know, uh, Middle Eastern domination of the overland route. So we get nutmeg and allspice, or sorry, nutmeg and mace, which are from the same plant cloves, allspice from the Caribbean, cardamom, you know, these are added to our previous um, spices and flavorings. And these, as you probably have noticed, are kind of the backbone of a lot of the Christmas flavors or the flavors that we associate with Christmas and the holidays. Um, so today we don't really associate cookies with rich people, 
but they very much were associated with the wealthy historically. Um, a lot of that has to do with the scarcity of ingredients. So we kind of already talked about um, sugar in particular being very scarce prior to the 16th century. Uh, and then also other foods, you know, butter is, is um, the pinnacle of animal fats for baking, right? White flour, refined white flour is very difficult to obtain and not in widespread use unless you're in a wealthy household. Um, things like nuts, having eggs in the wintertime, spices remain very expensive until the 19th century, although they do get cheaper as time goes on. And then also cookies themselves are quite difficult to bake uh, on an open fire, right? How do you bake cookies on an open hearth? Um, you don't really. Uh, you need to have access to a bake oven, which we're gonna get to in a minute. Um, and then cookies become really associated with Christmas feasting in large part because a lot of the Christmas season and Christmas feasting is a time to have very special foods, to kind of show off your wealth, to kind of splurge on the things that you're making. Um, and so cookies being kind of a rare commodity and a sign of wealth start to become associated with Christmas for that reason. Um, as I said earlier, cookies are not easy to bake really until the late 19th century. Um, they, you had to use a bake oven to make them historically, which I have an image in the next slide so you can see what I mean, but it's basically a large masonry oven. You um, build a fire inside the oven to kind of preheat it, and then you rake out the coals once it's hot enough, and then you're able to bake things in succession of hottest, needing the hottest temperature to the coolest temperature as the oven gradually cools down. In medieval Europe, a lot of um, big estates and, uh, you know, the aristocracy and royalty would have their own bake ovens. For the rest of the population, um, you would probably have a village baker who would have a bake oven, but people would generally not have their own bake ovens in their homes. Um, so cookie making also is professional for a lot of this early time period. Um, cookies also, you can just cut them, right? And you roll them flat and cut them, but a lot of them use molds or cookie cutters, which we'll also reference later. So you need some specialty equipment. Um, sweeteners remain, especially sugar, remains relatively scarce and expensive. Um, you need, again, like I said, special equipment like tin sheets to make them on. It's also why um, you can make cookies in a Dutch oven, but you're gonna be able to make like four. <laughs> No, not the dozens and dozens that we normally associate with the holidays. And we already talked a little bit about access for wealthy people versus your average household. The rich are gonna be much more able to access um, cookies and other more complicated confections than, than the lower classes, um, which is why pie is so popular in American history because you can bake pie very easily in a Dutch oven on an open hearth. Cakes and cookies, not so much. Um, so this is my image of a medieval bake oven, right? You can see there's, I don't know if you can see my mouse, there's this masonry structure over top. It's hollow on the inside. They have their little fire that they keep burning in the front. You notice there's like no chimney. The fire is just going up, right? Because you don't want all the heat to escape up the chimney in the bake oven. So when you're heating it, you keep the door open and the smoke comes out the front and there's probably a chimney uh, flue up here somewhere. Um, but you want all the heat to stay in the oven. So you have to rake the coals out and then using one of these nice long peels, it looks like a pizza peel, right? Very similar to a pizza oven. You're putting, this is bread. You're putting your bread in there. You would bake it in succession, like I said, from who needs, what needs the hottest temperatures So things like breads, cookies, cakes, to what needs the lowest temperatures to be basically the kind of stuff that we would put in a crock pot today now, right? Like beans, you know, tougher cuts of meat that you're gonna stew slowly over a long period of time. Um, and basically as the oven cools, you would shut, put the last things in and shut the door. Um, and in a lot of religious communities, which most of medieval Europe was, was very religious. Um, uh, so in the Christian tradition and also in the Jewish tradition, you generally don't wanna work on the Sabbath. So they would use bake ovens um, to cook their Sabbath meals overnight. Right in the Jewish tradition, that's cholent, uh, and in in a lot of um, 
Christian traditions, but the Catholic Church and a lot of Protestant traditions, it's other slow cooked foods. Um, and people would bring all of their stuff to the village baker, you know, right at the end of the baking day. And they would put everybody's stuff in and shut the door and then you would come and get it the next day. Um, so in the large household, you know, you have your own bake oven. So your cook, your professional cooking staff is going to, to manage your foods um, with the bake oven that way. But that's how an average person would have been able to access it. So cookies are also shaped, right? We talked a little bit about cookie molds. Um, those date back to the medieval period, but they really uh, become popular um, kind of like in the Elizabethan period to the early 19th century. Uh, and then cookie cutters start to take over. Those also date back to 15th century, 1400s, um, but they really take off in the 19th century as we get more uh, manufacturing, especially tin manufacturing. We also get tin sheets. Um, and I just have this little uh, image from a patent that was applied for by Alexander P. Ashburn, who was formerly enslaved inventor who gets this patent in uh, 1875. And it's for a biscuit cutter. Uh, and typically, if you find reference to him on the internet, people say that he is, it's a biscuit cutter for like Southern style, fluffy, you know, bready biscuits. Um, but I think it's for cookies. And I'll tell you why. One is because um, it's spring loaded, right? And so you're having it kind of flip over and then flip back. And the cutters, it's hard to tell, but they look kind of deep. Right, and if you're cutting biscuits, how do you get them out, right? But whereas if you're cutting cookie dough, it's probably just gonna leave an impression on the sheet. So I could be wrong, it could be for biscuits, uh, but as we'll find out in a couple of slides, the terminology around cookies and biscuits is not always super clear in the United States. Um, so anyway, we do also get the development of a cookie press for like extruded dough cookies. Um, Again, that dates back to the 16th century, uh, but it becomes super popular after the 1930s when the Miro Aluminum Company invents the cookie gun. Um, so extruded cookies like spritz, which we'll talk about later, uh, get really popular in the 1950s in the United States in particular. So let's talk about that terminology of what's a biscuit and what's a biscuit, right? Um, so the term biscuit is from the French um, biscuit, right, or twice cooked. It's actually probably, I put the hyphen in the wrong place. It's B-I-S hyphen cuit, because cuit means cooked or to cook in French. Um, and so that's where the British get the term biscuit from. They get a lot of terminology, food terminology from the French that Americans get from other languages, for instance, in British English, English, it's aubergine, right, which is the French word for eggplant. In the United States, it's eggplant. In in uh, um, Britain, it's courgette. In the United States, it's zucchini, right? We got it right from the Italians, whereas the British had it, the French got it from the Italians, and then it went to the British. So there's a much more French influence on food-based language in the UK than there is in the United States. Um, the Italian biscotti is also twice cooked and theirs actually are twice cooked. If you've ever made biscotti from scratch, you know that you make it in a little loaf, you bake it, you slice it up and then you bake it again, right? So it gets really dry and crisp. Um, ironically in English, the term for that type of cookie is rusk. And then they just use biscuit for, for regular cookies. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Um, Americans say cookie because of the Dutch. Um, Cook, yeah. Uh, cook is the word for cake, and ye in, in Dutch is like a diminutive. So cook, yeah, is like a little cake or a small cake. Um, and we use the Dutch terminology because New York was originally, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, and, and Delaware were originally a Dutch colony uh, called New Netherland from like 1614 to 1664, 1674, thereabouts. Um, and uh, the Dutch culture in New York in particular, because that was the most populous area of the, of the Dutch colony, hangs on well into the 19th century. 
So we have a fair number of um, Dutch words that make its way into our version of English that are not present in British English, largely because the time that New Netherland was a colony, uh, Holland and England were at war with each other <laughs> and fighting over stuff. Um, but that's why we say cookie and not biscuit. How our fluffy raised bready biscuits get the name biscuit is less clear, um, but it probably comes up from the South, which was pretty solidly, particularly Virginia, uh, pretty solidly an English colony, um, first and foremost, and, and not Dutch. So uh, there's some similar linguistics in other languages. So like in Norwegian and a lot of the Scandinavian languages, uh, the word is small kake. So a small cake. I had to look this up because I I know in, in Spanish, the word for cooking is galleta, but etymologists don't know where that word came from or what it means. It kind of maybe means gallon, but they don't know why the Spanish means that to mean cookie. So if there are any native Spanish speakers who want to give me their opinions, I couldn't find anything on the internet about it. So Happy, happy to entertain alternate stories there. Um, and then the Germans, interestingly, it's one of those things where like, it means multiple things. So the German is Plätzchen. Plätz, Plätzchen, I can't pronounce German as well as Norwegian, obviously, which means a little place, but a Platz also means a flat round cake. So again, it's like a diminutive of a cake, Plätzchen. Um, and then there's the spelling. Right, we don't have standardized spelling until really the 1840s when Daniel Webster publishes his dictionary, but the spelling of cookie is really not standardized until the modern era. So I have this fun Google Ngram. If you've never used Google Ngram, uh, what it does is you can type some words in and it'll search all of Google Books, right? So all the digitized publications that they have, and it'll tell you how many hits there are for, for each word in each year that you're looking at, right? So I actually did this from 1800, which is the earliest time period you can do uh, to the present. And you would not have been able to see any of this on that list because the blue line, the cookie line just goes like whoop, way up as we get into the modern era. So I just did 1800 to 1950 um, because I wanted to see this kind of more competitive part here. So I put some more obscure spellings on there. I think in the 18 teens, cookie may have been a person who was a cook, right? Um, but the other spellings, especially with the Y, really persists. Um, cookie with an IE starts to take over in the 1920s, but cookie with a Y persists really until the 1940s, 50s, and then it really dies off. So the IE takes over. Don't ask me why that becomes a standard spelling. <laughs> But it does, and so that's why we spell it that way today. So I talked a little bit about New Netherland, right? So I thought we could talk a little bit about um, Dutch cookie traditions and why we have this word cookie that comes from the Dutch. Um, so interestingly, in Dutch culture, particularly in the New Netherland period, um, the Dutch Reformed Church was not super into Christmas. Uh, they're Calvinist. Uh, that was the official state church of Holland, although as a republic, um, Holland did have a policy of toleration of other religions. So that's why New Netherland, um, a lot of uh, Protestant groups escaping religious persecution come to New Netherland, including I found out the other day the pilgrims were originally trying to aim for New Netherland because, of course, they're British separatists. And they lived uh, in Holland for over a decade before they came. They accidentally ended up uh, in Plymouth, which I found very interesting. But so New Netherland has um, uh, Huguenots and Walloons, and they have um, Jews and you know Ch people from the Czech Republic, and and also maybe some Puritans and other groups. Um, so they have this even though they had an official religion, they had this policy of toleration. And so you get this kind of melting pot of all these different European religions um, in the New Netherland at the time. But I'm digressing. Uh, cookies, however, in this time period, because the, the Dutch Calvinists were not super big 
into Christmas, kind of like the Puritans, right? It's considered a Catholic slash pagan holiday. Um, they mostly associate cookies with funerals and with New Year's Day. And you might be like, Sarah, cookies and funerals? What's that about, right? But it was a way to display your wealth and also to give people kind of a souvenir from, from the funerals, kind of like a favor for the funeral that you would make a cookie if people attended. Um, there is one exception. Oh, the first print reference, of course, is in New York, 1703. That's the first print reference to a cookie and it's talking about a funeral. Um, the Dutch do have, however, St. Nicholas Day, which was, I think, yesterday, right? What's today's date? Yeah, it's the 6th. So it's usually celebrated on the 5th or the 6th. Um, and that is kind of like their children's holiday. There's complaints in the 16th and 17th century of, you know, Dutch reform church people kind of, you know, railing against the celebration of St. Nicholas Day, but regular people were like, nope, this is, we're going to do this. Um, so it's kind of like Dutch Christmas. St. Nicholas comes and visits all the children and he brings them speculus. So this is a figure. Um, it's basically a giant gingerbread cookie, although speculus don't contain ginger. They're, they're just um, cinnamon flavored. And it's very popular um, on St. Nicholas Day. If you've, you've ever heard of windmill cookies, those are speculus. And if you've ever been on a flight and had Biscoff cookies, <laughs> <laughs> or if you've ever had Biscoff spread, that is speculus, right? So that is the was the signature snack of KLM, um, the uh, Dutch Airlines, right? Uh, and it's kind of spilled over into other airlines. So um, that's our that's where we get our word cookie from, and kind of our first association of cookies in the United States with the Christmas season. Uh, like I said, the speculus is kind of a little bit like gingerbread. Gingerbread dates back, it's probably the oldest of our Christmas cookies. It dates back to medieval Europe. Um, I have a friend, Neil De Marino, who's also a food historian who specializes in recreating historic recipes like as accurately as possible. He did a whole talk on the history of gingerbread and he recreated a 14th century recipe. So dating back to the 1300s um, for gingerbread. And it was very different from what we consider gingerbread today. It was just honey, breadcrumbs, and ginger. And you steeped the ginger in the honey and then mixed it with breadcrumbs, kind of like a medieval cake pop in texture. <laughs> They're just these little kind of soft, very, very sweet, somewhat spicy um, little balls of, of like kind of crunchy dough. So not the best compared to our other cookie options. <laughs> so I can see why nobody is really making that one anymore. Um, but that is kind of the earliest incarnation of gingerbread in medieval Europe. A lot of European gingerbreads also contain black pepper because ginger and black pepper were the two um, earliest spices that were available prior to um, the spice trade uh, with the spice islands in Southeast Asia. And you see this pepper name kind of persisting in a lot of cookies, Pfeffernusse, right? The German pepper nuts, literally pepperkocker, which is Swedish, right? That's pepper cookies or pepper cakes. Um, and then our first reference to gingerbread men comes from Queen Elizabeth. She had a banquet and she kind of, I don't know if it was secretly or, or in the open, but she had figures um, carved in molds of the people who attended her banquet and then had them made into gingerbread cookies. So it'd kind of be like if you went to a party and you got served a cake with the picture of your face on it, right? <laughs> so it's kind of a weird thing, but also kind of showing off, right, that her cooks have this skill, she can afford to make these expensive things, and she can afford to have these customized molds to sort of flatter the people who are attending her banquet. Um, and like I said, these are these molds be kind of become more and more elaborate as time goes on. This one is from the 1750s. This is a wooden one. Most of them are wooden. You would occasionally find some of them made out of like pewter or even silver, um, but the wooden ones were the most common. And the gingerbread recipes at this time period 
um, are a little bit different than what we make today because you have to have a very specific ratio of like sugar to flour to get these and fat to get these molds um, to reproduce fine detail. Uh, if you just try and use whatever gingerbread recipe, it's probably going to stick. It's probably not going to turn out right. So um, yeah, it's a very interesting art to making gingerbread out of molds like this. This is a fun uh, 19th century image that kind of harkens back to an earlier era. Um, I'd mentioned before that a lot of cookie making in the period, particularly in Europe, was done by professionals. So this is an example of a gingerbread stall at a church fair. So it's in the evening and you can see all of the gingerbreads lined up on these little shelves. And so there's the professional baker who's selling them. You could see the heart motif. And then the green thing in the middle is candied fruit, right? So they'd be decorated with candied fruit. And people would, particularly young women, and we talked a little bit about this in the Halloween talk about, you know, kind of like food divination. Well, they did a little bit of that at Christmas too. You would get a gingerbread and eat or give a gingerbread in the shape of something that you wanted, right? So the heart was for love, or if you were a young woman who was like, wanted a husband, you might eat a gingerbread man, right? That kind of stuff. Um, so there was a little bit of lore associated with that as well. So we talked about the Dutch, right? As their influence on uh, kind of our American cookie heritage. The other early one and probably a pretty big influence is the British. Um, but I think there's a reason why we don't have biscuits mostly in the United States that we have cookies. And that's because the British do not have a strong Christmas cookie association. Um, their main Christmas foods are Christmas pudding, which has a whole ritual around it, including stir about Sunday, which is several Sundays before Christmas when you would make the pudding so it had time to age. Um, mince pies, huge deal in the UK to this day around Christmas. Fruit cake obviously has, you know, some kind of international connections. Um, but definitely the British super love their fruit cake. And then gingerbread and shortbread are their really only two main um, Christmas cookie traditions where they're um, popular and well known outside of the UK, right? Um, our Christmas in the United States is very influenced by the British, largely by Queen Victoria and her German husband, Prince Albert. Um, prior to the Victorian period, there are no Christmas trees outside of German households in the United States um, because that's a very German thing to do. And it's not popularized outside of German immigrant communities until Queen Victoria through Prince Albert adopts it um, and starts having them kind of in Buckingham Palace. And then it gets to be kind of all the rage, right? So just a fun 19th century postcard of um, stir about Sunday and this is you know late 19th century was kind of super into like medieval revivalism and also like the Shakespearean era so particularly around Christmas so you have ye merry Christmas at a time right oldie timey writing ye family stir about the... and so what they're doing is the maids and cooks are actually making the pudding and then what appears to be our relatively wealthy family they're all taking a turn at stirring it and it was like you'd make a wish there was good luck um and then it's either stir about or stir it up sometimes it's the other version of it sunday you would do that several sundays before christmas because you're going to douse everything in alcohol <laughs> and the pudding has to age right before you bake it or or steam it depending on on which type of pudding you're making um shortbread although the brits claim it not actually english right it dates back to scotland in the 12th century but it really starts to get popularized in the 17th century in scotland um and that is in large part because um the 16th century in scotland was really hard on scottish people there was like plague there was economic depression it was not a great time but in the 17th century they opened up trade relations with england right they're starting to be able to import things um, and export products um primarily dairy, right? Scotland at this time, we now think of like, oh, Scotland is all about the oats, but their major export um, was cattle and dairy, in particular dairy products. So we are getting English wheat is coming up. Uh, and you have plenty of dairy 
in your area. So those are the two primary ingredients in shortbread once you add sugar. So they start to become very popular after that time period. Mary Queen of Scots is credited with popularizing shortbread. That was supposed to be like her favorite thing. So Queen Bess has gingerbread and her rival sister has shortbread. Um, and then also Queen Victoria, the arbiter of taste of the 19th century, kind of has a Scottish obsession. She popularizes tartan and also shortbread. Um, and if you follow Martha Stewart at all or have been following her from since the 90s for a while there, she had a real obsession with, with shortbread molds. Um, so this is a picture of one of her shortbreads in a Scottish shortbread mold. It's got the very classic thistle, right? The symbol of Scotland. Um, and so like gingerbread, historically shortbreads were also a molded cookie. Today, we tend to cut them um, you know, in circles, right? Or, or um, if you're doing the more traditional kind, you might cut it in wedges like this, but most people are not packing it into molds um, like would have been done in the time period. So where does that leave us with cookies in America, right? We're kind of coming out of the colonial period in the 18th century. We're starting to become, excuse me, our own country. Uh, and there's a bunch of things happening in the 19th century that are influencing how and why Americans are eating cookies. Um, one is that compared to the average European, uh, individual free white Americans have a way more access to wealth and resources um, than their European counterparts. Like definitely we have plenty of super rich people in the colonial and early modern period in the United States. Um, but we also have, we're starting to develop a middle class Right, and we have farmers who own their own land. They are not tenant farmers to manor lords or aristocrats, they own their own land. Um, and as a counterpoint to that, we do also have um, more access to labor through slavery. So slavery was legal in all of the 13 colonies until the American Revolution when some of the Northern states start to declare um, abolition. Um, not all of them do. Uh, New York, where I live, basically doesn't end slavery until 1827 or later. Um, New Jersey, which is just to the south of me, uh, slavery is not deemed illegal there until 1865 with the 13th Amendment. So I think there's this concept that slavery is just a thing in the south, but it was really predominant in the north uh, until the mid, you know, first quarter uh, of the 19th century in a lot of areas. And even for people, if you live in a free state or, or you know, you didn't actually enslave people, people still benefited greatly from enslaved labor, largely through the sugar plantations in the Caribbean. And that's actually an interesting facet of the abolition movement is the kind of rejection of sugar and trying to have sugar alternatives because sugar was a product of slavery. Um, but because it's a product of slavery, it's cheap and accessible uh, and in widespread use, right? Particularly in the 19th century as we kind of get the, the mechanization um, of, of sugar processing. The United States, as it urbanizes, we also get the development of professional bakers and caterers, not so much like our village baker who's baking bread, um, but people who are doing confections, right? People who are catering parties for people who can't afford like a live-in chef, right? There are hoteliers and, and spas and stuff springing up where you have this professional class of people who are making confections that most ordinary people are not making in their own household. Um, we do also get a huge influx of European immigrants in the 18th and 19th centuries that really have an impact on how, how Americans are celebrating Christmas, particularly in the Christmas cookie um, era area. So we'll be talking about those different groups. So just a brief overview of immigration that's coming to the United States kind of in these waves. In the early colonial period, um, it's mostly English. And then we have Dutch, Spanish, Scottish. We have, um, like I said, religious dissidents like the Moravians, the Huguenots, the Palatine Germans. Um, those are really our early 
immigrants. We do also have Jews, um, some people from the Middle East, obviously, lots of people who are who are not voluntarily coming here, enslaved Africans. Uh, and then in the early 19th century, we start to get an influx of more Germans, and particularly the Irish, especially after um, the potato famine in, in the 1840s. The latter half of the 19th century, again, we have our waves of Irish coming over, more and more Scandinavians are coming over, Italians, Bohemians, right? Say Palatine Germans, Germany was not a unified country at this time, so we have Bohemians, people coming from the Middle East. There were a number of um, droughts and economic issues happening in the Middle East in the late 19th century. Eastern Europeans, Chinese, right, to a lesser extent, Japanese, they're more into the 20th century. So these, all of these immigrant groups are having an impact on American foodways. And then in the early 20th century, we have Russians, particularly Russian Jews escaping pogroms. Eastern Europeans, again, especially Jews for the same reason. Uh, more Mediterranean immigrants, Greeks, Lebanese, Syrians, um, all of these people having big impacts on our foodways. So we're going to talk about some of them who specialize in Christmas cookies. And our earliest group, besides the Dutch, uh, is the Moravians, right? So the Moravian church is probably the earliest Protestant church. Um, it predates uh, Martin Luther and the 95 Theses by several decades. Uh, it's founded in the Czech Republic and they are the first Protestant sect to send missionaries out into the world. So obviously the Catholic Church, Jesuits, right? They had missionaries for a very long time, but the Moravians are the first Protestants to send out missionaries. Uh, their first, one of their first missions they found in 1740 in Dutchess County, New York, which is like literally just across the river from me, um, they found a mission with the Mohican people. Uh, they're, they're Native Americans native to this area. Um, the Moravians are expelled by the English um, colonial government at this time in New York because they think they are riling up the Native population uh, in, in, to coincide with the French and Indian War. So they go to Pennsylvania. Um, and they are kind of one of the early progenitors of some of our cookie traditions. So they're very famous for their spice cookies, molasses cookies, uh, and sugar cookies, right? They're kind of in the origins of who invents sugar cookies. They're kind of, it's very amorphous, but they're kind of up there of, of popularizing this style of sugar cookie. Um, a large group of Moravians do also settle in the New Salem, North Carolina area. Gosh, I think it's in North Carolina. I'm so bad at my Southern geography, I'm sorry. Um, so there, you still see Moravian cookies there. And then obviously Bethlehem, Pennsylvania is like Christmas capital of Pennsylvania. And they have, they're very famous for their Moravian star, right? Um, so that's one of our first cookie groups besides the touch. Uh, another very obvious one is the Germans. The Germans are really doing a lot of cookie, um, how should we say this, uh, like innovations, cookie innovations in the medieval area. So one of the earliest is Lebkuchen, which is a type of gingerbread. We have Springerly, which dates back to the 14th century in Swabia. Um, Zimsterna, our 17th century. Uh, Pfeffernusa, our 1750s. I thought they were much earlier than that, so I was surprised to find that date. Um, and then, of course, our first German immigrants are the Palatine Germans who come over to New York at the behest of Queen Anne in 1705, 1709, one of those two. Um, you know, she's like, hey, go make pine pitch for me in the Hudson Valley and you can settle there and that'll be fine. But guess what? Hudson Valley pine trees don't produce pitch for, you know, waterproofing ships. So they try their best, but they eventually abandon that settlement and move up into the Mohawk River Valley. Um, so those are some of our earliest German immigrants. And then of course in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Dutch aren't really from the Netherlands, it's the Pennsylvania Deutsch, right? There are more people escaping religious persecution, it's a theme in American history, um, and they end up uh, settling in Pennsylvania. And then again, 
the German Christmas traditions are popularized in the 19th century through Prince Albert during the Victorian period. Um, so I found this really sweet postcard kind of illustrating. Uh, it's a German postcard from 1909, but it's illustrating some of these classic treats. So there's like fruit and nuts and stuff, but we also have gingerbread with the candied, green candied fruit. We have gingerbread with chocolate, which is a thing that they did. And then there's also some fruit cakes over here and then a little Santa figure, um, little book of fairy tales, right? Fun stuff for kids. So I thought we'd go over some American versions of some of these immigrant um, cookie recipes. So this is from uh, American Cookery, the Boston Cooking School magazine from 1909 for Springerly. Uh, very typical recipe of this time period that it's just literally a paragraph of text and you kind of doesn't always give you the best instructions. Um, but I picked it because it came with this great image of the Springerly mold and then what it looks like when the cookies are cut out. So springlies are, <coughs> excuse me, very, very white, um, light colored egg white based cookies. Uh, and then they, they are pressed on anise seed, right on the bottom. And then you press the other side into, into the springly mold. Um, so they're very white on the front and then they have those anise seeds on the back for anise flavor. This is a little bit simpler recipe um, also American cookbook from the early 20th century. Um, but you can see like the ingredients, it's a little easier. So it's flavored with lemon and anise, right? And this is a modern version of um, some springerly molds. And it gives you an idea of how white these cookies are. So they're not really, you know, we normally probably think of like spicy, spice-based cookies if we're not doing our American sugar cookies. Um, but this was giving you some variation in color, but also still that very, very fine detail on the molds is showing up. Lebkuchen in, in Germany, um, usually flavor, it's a gingerbread, but doesn't always have ginger. This version, there's two, there's number one and number two, I'll show you next. Number one is a little simpler. Um, it's just cinnamon and citron, right? Which is a, a candy, it's a citrus fruit that's grown basically just for the, the skin and the pith. Um, and then it's candied, probably if you've had fruitcake, you've had some citron uh, and then almonds. And then number two is much more complicated uh, and darker, right? So it's got brown sugar and molasses. It's got multiple spices. It's got orange peel and citron, almonds and chocolate, right? So I find it interesting, these two variations on Lebkuchen. Uh, and then this one says to ice with egg frosting. Right, and so that, this is an example of modern lab cooking that's been decorated with icing. Um, most European cookies are either not decorated or they're pressed into molds and that's the decoration or they're decorated with, with relatively simple icing um, or candied fruit, uh, not like American style, which we'll get to. Um, Pfeffernusa, I love this recipe because it's Pfeffernusa, but man, is this an American recipe because we're using corn syrup, in New Orleans molasses, right? Those are two main ingredients. So again, um, even though it says pfeffer for pepper, right? Pepper nuts, there's no actual black pepper. The flavoring is cinnamon and cloves. And again, with citron, lemon, the Germans love to have lemon flavor uh, in their cookies. And then Zinster, now this is one that I discovered when I was doing research for this talk. Um, if you or someone you love is gluten-free, this is a great historic recipe to try because this recipe contains no flour, right? It's it's an egg white um, and almond cookie flavored with, again, cinnamon and lemon, right? Because we're German, so we like to put lemon in things. Um, these are ones I would like to try. I haven't tried them yet, uh, but they're called Zimsterna, which is cinnamon stars. Right here's the English version. This is from the Joy of Cooking cookbook. Um, but uh, they're usually shaped as like kind of into star shapes. So our other kind of influential group in terms of Christmas cookies, although you may not know it, is the Italians. Italians have a lot of Christmas related food traditions, cookies being one of them. Um, and of course, here in the Northeast, we have a very large Italian population, particularly in New York. 
So some of their more famous ones, which I couldn't find dates on, so I apologize for that. Um, but Pizzelles are very popular in this area in New York, uh, Italian Christmas cookie. They're crisp, relatively thick, crunchy wafers that are, again, embossed with a design. This is a theme in our historic Christmas cookies. There's the biscotti, which I mentioned earlier. Amaretti, which are one of my favorites, which are very chewy almond cookies. It's like an egg white almond flavored cookie. Um, Agnetti, which again, I did not know about until I started doing research for this talk. Apparently the favorite Christmas cookie in a lot of Italian immigrant communities, it's an anise flavored cookie that is frosted. And often you'll see like colored sprinkles on top. That's a very American addition. Um, Strifoli, which are technically not a cookie, but are like little teeny balls of fried dough with honey. And then my personal favorite, which I am addicted to, only the good kind though, which is tricolore or rainbow cookies, um, which are sort of vaguely related to pedophores. There, It's um, colored almond sponge, usually layered with apricot and or raspberry jam. And then it's the it's like in long logs and it's dipped in chocolate and then they're sliced crosswise so you can see the layers and these are a very italian american cookie they're not necessarily produced in italy today um, but they're called tricolore because they were invented in the 1870s as a pro-italian unification celebration right like a lot of european countries italy was this disparate mass of city states, and then they unified in the late 19th century as one country, the boot shaped country that we all know and love today. Um, and so, Tre Colore were, were to help promote uh, Italian unification. They got to be so popular in uh, New York in particular that Jewish delis also started making them. Uh, and then, of course, after unification, and also, if you're not Italian, you don't need, you need to call them tre colore, the tr three colors of the Italian flag, right? Green, white, and red. Um, and they become rainbow cookies. Uh, if you can lay your hands on one and you can get some good ones, they're delicious. I love them. Uh, but there's a lot of mediocre ones out there. So the good ones are like, there's real, you know, almond, almond paste, almond sponge, and they're like really good jam. The chocolate is good. They're like, soft but not soggy it's it's a hard balance but when they're done well they're delicious just to remind everybody what biscotti looks like i couldn't find good pictures of the other cookies um this one is near and dear to my heart i am 100 percent scandinavian i grew up in a very scandinavian household um but also a lot of scandinavian christmas cookies uh kind of get used and popular outside of scandinavian immigrant communities um, so the first is peppercooker, which I mentioned before we started recording. Um, my grandmother used to make rolled very, very thin, um, very crisp, very spicy with black pepper, gingerbread, um, usually cut into star or heart shapes. If you've ever had Anna's Swedish ginger cookies, that's like an okay version of peppercooker, but um, the homemade kind are so much better. Uh, and in my family, if you got heart-shaped ones, which is always what my grandma would make, you would put the heart in your palm and press your finger in the middle. And if it broke into three even pieces, you could make a wish, right? So we would always break it in our palm and see if we could break it into three pieces. Usually not, right? Which is why you get to make a wish because it's hard to do. Um, spritz, there's some disagreement over whether spritz are actually German or if they are Scandinavian, um, Scandinavian countries being Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. I'm sure they have a lot of trade with Germany. The word spritz means to squirt in German, uh, but definitely in the United States, they're popularized by Scandinavians. So I am giving this one to the Scandinavians. It's an extruded, rich, um, buttery dough cookie, usually in a wreath or an S shape. Um, and very, very delicate, delicious, crunchy, but tender, hard to replicate, easy to make if you can manage to get them through the cookie press. Satiman are a cookie that you don't actually see that often outside of Scandinavian um, immigrant communities. It is a fried cookie. 
usually made with cream instead of butter. And basically you cut it into a little strip and then you cut a slit in the middle and flip it through, which is what some other European countries do as a fried cookie or fried bread. Um, Krim kaka are pictured here. They are related to pizzelles, sort of, um, and also to Dutch waffler, but they're, they're much thinner and more delicate than pizzelles and they're rolled into this cone shape. Or in some historic recipes, you'll see them um, saying that you roll them around a, a broom handle so they could be more cylindrical. You would think the cone shape meant that they would be filled. Usually not. Sometimes people would, but usually they would not be filled. Uh, and then the other most popular one, sanbakasa, uh, individual being sanbakals, right? Um, really date to the 1850s when, when tin smithing got popular, which is also when a lot of cookie cutters in the United States get popular. Um, and I'll show you why in a minute. So just some, that was my dog. Sorry, my dog just came up here if you heard that. Um, Pepper Cocker, just some recipes. There's this great cookbook online. It's part of um, uh, North Dakota, which is where I'm from, North Dakota Cooperative Extension, published this recipe called Recipes from Many Lands. And they have a giant Scandinavian like cookie section. Um, so this is just one of many Peppercocka recipes. I, I chose it because they have it spelled phonetically Peppercocka, right? Um, so just a recipe there and you can see it's got the black pepper and it also makes a big recipe, right? Because we have a gallon of flour, but that's when you're making Christmas cookies, you might as well make for the whole community, right? Um, spritz, again, probably Scandinavian, really starts to get popularized after that 1930s cookie press is uh, produced by the Miro um, Aluminum Com Company, and then they get super popular in the 1950s when Scandinavian cooking in general kind of has a little revival. Um, I like it because there's different spellings. So spritz with an S, it's a sprit cookie, right? Run through sprit cookie form. Sorry, my dogs just came up here. <laughs> but it's literally just like sugar and butter and eggs and deliciousness. So if you haven't made them, I recommend them. Sanbakelsa, there were a million Sanbakel recipes. So this is page one. Here's page two. And we were talking a little bit before we started about sand tarts. So this is what I associate sand tarts with, is these little, they're called sand tarts because sanbakelsa are very crisp and kind of crumbly, right? Kind of a sandy texture, not as sandy as like pecan sandies, but, but similar. Um, and they look like this. They have all different shapes of these little tins. Um, and you know you press them in, so they're not really like tart shells. Although you can put jam or cream or whatever if you want in them, but most Scandinavians just eat them plain, right? Uh, Fatima, I could not find a good picture, but these recipes um, illustrate that they're not made with flour; they're made with cream, right? And then you're supposed to fry them. Some some cut them in a diamond shape. Um, but this has any desired shape. Um, but this is this is the more traditional one. It says roll real thin and cut about three inch squares, making a hole in the center with a knife. And then a lot of people also flip them through, so that makes a little twist on the sides. Cream kaka, again a million recipes attributed to Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Right, everybody's making them. Uh, and I love this one. These cookies resemble ice cream cones, but are served as an ordinary cookie. And also you see um, a lot of phonetic spelling instead of cream kaka, you see cream kage, right? Cream kage, that's a more old fashioned pronunciation. Sorry, the dogs. American cookies are a little bit different. They kind of absorb a lot of these immigrant traditions and a lot of these very old cookies stay on as a longstanding tradition. But American cookies, as kind of pictured here, We've got, you know, like your fruit cakes, your gingerbreads, you know, your little almond cookies, whatever. But then we also have colored sugar. We have royal icing. We've got all these different shapes. We've got like little red hot candies, right? Um, all these different ways of decorating that you don't necessarily see in European Christmas traditions. So I thought we would talk about some of the most popular ones. 
that have a cool backstory. So we've got peanut butter blossom, Mexican wedding cookies, which have a million names, which we'll talk about. Um, and then there's also cutout cookies, right? Like pictured here, a lot of people said their favorite Christmas cookie is a frosted sugar cookie or a sugar cookie with like the colored sugar um, on top. Uh, and colored sugar and sprinkles are definitely a very American addition to the Christmas cookie pantheon. Um, so I thought we would start with peanut blossoms. This is the, probably the best story out of all of them because it's the most recent, so we have the most history on it. Um, peanut blossoms or peanut butter blossoms were submitted to the Pillsbury Bake Off. So the Pillsbury Flower Company in 1949 starts this annual Bake Off as a way to promote their flower products, um, but also as like, so it's a promotional thing, but then people from all over the country are submitting all these recipes. Um, so Mrs. Chester Smith, right, because it's the 50s, so we can't have first names for women. Uh, Mrs. Chester Smith submits hers in 1957, and she wins, but not the overall competition. She wins the Grand National in the senior category because she is a senior citizen. The winner that year is a very forgettable, like base, like interestingly shaped, kind of accordion y shaped, but just like almond cookie. Um, this cookie is the one that everybody remembers from this bake off. Uh, and it gets to be so popular that Hershey's starts printing the recipe on the back of the Hershey's kiss bag. It's basically a soft um, uh, peanut butter cookie that you bake in the oven and when it's all soft still and you take it out and it's hot, you plop a Hershey kiss on top and it kind of crinkles, right? And makes that crackly surface. Uh, and then the kiss like sticks in it cause it's hot so it melts and then when it cools, most of the time, if you do it right, it stays on there. Sometimes they fall off. Um, it becomes insanely popular. I think it for a number of reasons. One, it's got the very American combination of peanut butter and chocolate. A lot of other countries around the world, if they eat peanuts and peanut butter, they don't eat them with sweets like Americans do. Like peanut butter and jelly is a very foreign concept to a lot of people in other parts of the world. Um, but this peanut butter chocolate combination is distinctly American, super popular. They're also incredibly easy to make and they're not expensive, right? You, you, peanut butter is cheap. Hershey Kisses are cheap. You don't have to buy fancy candied fruit. You don't have to buy fancy spices. You don't have to buy all these fancy ingredients. They're easy to make. The kids can help you with them, right? So they kind of take over by the 19, late 1960s. Um, they're pretty much everywhere. Uh, I think also because a lot more women are working outside the home in the 70s and 80s, and they're they're looking for something quick and easy, and these just kind of fit fit the bill. Then there's that one cookie, right? My them them is Mexican wedding cookies, Russian tea cakes, Mexican wedding cakes, um, snowballs, right? They have all these different names. They seem to be a kind of a universal cookie, but it's a nut based kind of buttery, crumbly cookie that's rolled in powdered sugar. There are a lot of versions in that in a lot of European um, cookie traditions, including the Middle East. And it's not super clear where they come from. Um, my prevailing theory is that they come from the Middle East because there is a very similar, very ancient cookie there called a mamul, which is similar in a lot of ways, except for there's date paste in the middle, but it's a, it's a nut-based round cookie that's rolled in powdered sugar while it's still warm, crumbly texture. They just have that little surprise of date paste in the middle. Um, so the originals I think were made with almonds or walnuts, probably came to Europe or the Americas uh, via Spain, right? We have Moorish Spain. And then when Spain comes to Mexico to colonize Mexico where pecans are native, I think that's where we get the Mexican wedding cake. They are very popular to serve at weddings in Mexico, which is probably where that name comes from. This name, there is no evidence of a cookie like this that I could find in any Russian cookbooks. Um, granted, I'm only reading the translated versions of Russian cookbooks, but they don't show up anywhere. I have no idea where the term Russian tea cake comes from. It's possible that it was served in like a Russian tea room, 
because those were popular at the turn of the 20th century and that's where that name comes from. That name kind of disappears in the 1950s in favor of Mexican wedding cake in large part because of the Red Scare. So we can't have anything called Russian because that smacks of communism, right, in the 1950s. Um, so also in the 1950s, you see the rise of the name Snowball, which is apt. We're making them at Christmas. They kind of look like snowballs. It's very wintry. And then the pecan sandy is the non-powdered sugar cousin to Mexican wedding cakes, Mexican wedding cookies, whatever you want to call them. Snowballs, all the names they have. Um, they are another one of the most popular um, Christmas cookies after sugar cookies and peanut blossoms, right? So Americans also, we leave cookies out for Santa. Where does that where does that come from? I mean, other countries leave treats out for their magical Christmas visitors, but not usually cookies. Um, in Scandinavia, you leave food out on Christmas Eve for your Nissa in Norway or Tomta in Sweden. Uh, and they're kind of like little elves, brownies, hobs, whatever you want to call them, that like help around the house. Um, and you know, you're not supposed to like give them gifts and you're not supposed to acknowledge them and they'll, you know, keep the farm running. They take care of the animals. They make sure that there's no, you know, your open hearth doesn't like, catch anything on fire and burn stuff down, right? They're just kind of like household spirits that are, are there to help. Um, so on Christmas Eve, you leave them a treat. And if you don't, they might abandon you and then you don't have a household spirit and things could go wrong. So in Norway, they get rumigrots which is a like a very rich cream-based porridge. Um, very easy to make, super delicious. Uh, I recommend it if you can find the recipe online. Uh, in Sweden, they get rice pudding, right? And then also a lot of Swedes eat rice pudding around Christmas time, just like Norwegians eat Irmigrat around Christmas time. Uh, in Britain, Santa gets sherry, which I'm like very clever, very clever British parents that on Christmas Eve, <laughs> your child leaves a drink out for you, right? Um, in Germany, they they leave their letters for Santa on Christmas Eve. So German German parents are maybe playing a little bit of chicken of what their, their kids are gonna get for Christmas. <laughs> They're not telling Santa until right on Christmas Eve. Uh, in the Netherlands, right? This is for Sinterklaas, not necessarily for Christmas Eve. Um, they leave out carrots and hay for Santa Claus's donkey, right, in their shoes, and then they get their treats in their wooden shoes. Um, but in the United States, we leave cookies and milk. So I guess we're, it's a magical visitor, we're leaving them out. But why cookies and milk, right? So um, one of the theories, there are many theories, but one of the theories is that uh, Christmas in the United States, particularly in the early period before we have railroads and, and even good roads in general, winter is the easiest time to travel because in the northern states, the ground is frozen, the rivers are frozen, right? It's easier to get around than traveling overland. Um, and this is a time period when there's not a lot of hotels or rest areas or anything. So if you need to stop for the night, you're going to go to the closest house and just knock on the door and be like, hey, can I stay here for the night? So it's kind of a hospitality thing, right? That you're, everybody's going to bed on Christmas Eve, you keep the fire lit, you leave out provisions for any, any visitors that might come by because you wanna be hospitable, right? And that extends to Santa Claus. Um, I, the earliest reference, print reference I found to it was from the 1870s. And it's a little girl in a book expressing uh, some skepticism that Santa is actually the one eating the cookies and milk. So probably the tradition is older than that, but that's the first, first print reference I could find. And then why, why are we eating Christmas cookies at Christmas in the United States, right? Anybody can make cookies by the time we get to the end of the 19th century. Um, so why are we still making them? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that are happening. One is that we have some changes in our agriculture in the 19th century. Mechanization means that sugar production is easier and even cheaper than it was before. Um, also changes in our flour production means that refined 
white shelf stable flour is widely and relatively cheaply accessible. We also have the development of chemical leaveners, uh, the earliest ones being pearl ash, which date back to the late 18th century uh, in Albany, New York. If you've ever read Amelia Simmons' uh, American Cookery book, she calls for pearl ash. That is a part of the potash or potash um, uh, industry, uh, which is, you know, basically pearl ash is an early uh, predecessor to baking soda. Right, so she calls, she's one of the first cookbooks in the world to call for the use of pearl ash. We have hartshorn or baker's ammonia. A lot of people were talking about sugar cookies. A lot of people still make those baker's ammonia, old fashioned sugar cookies. Um, baking soda, obviously, and then baking powder. Baking soda needs an acid to rise. That can be anything from buttermilk to molasses, depending on your recipe, um, or you can add cream of tartar. Baking soda, a baking powder is just baking soda and cream of tartar already combined, right? And then we have changes in kitchen technology. We have the advent of stoves. So instead of having to rely on a bake oven, all of a sudden you have this cast iron stove that is a more reliable, excuse me, more reliable heat source. And then as we get gas stoves and electric stoves, things get even more reliable and predictable. So it becomes easier and easier to make cookies at home. Um, refrigerators give us things like icebox cookies and slice and bake cookies and things like that. And so this is the early 19th century kitchen. Um, this image is probably from the 1840s, but this is a fairly typical uh, kitchen frontier style kitchen of the period. So you can see there's this big open hearth um, with a hook for all of your, your pots. And then this is a, a tin kitchen for spit roasting meat, but guess what? There's no bake oven anywhere in here. In a household that had a bake oven, it would usually be a little arched brick hole in the corner here, right? That would, you would get some heat from, from the, of the fire, but then you could also build a fire in there to actually bake. So are we making cookies over here? No, we're making pie because that is very easy to make in a Dutch oven on an open hearth. This is a little bit later from the 1870s. So here we have this beautiful cast iron stove. We have hot water. We've got a sink with running water, right? But where's, where's our oven? Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. Maybe we don't have one and that's why we're making pie. <laughs> we're still not making cookies. We're making apple pie, right? Um, so really it's the 20th century that we really solidify cookies, Christmas cookies as this kind of American tradition rather than individual immigrant communities it becomes a more widespread American tradition. Of course, we have the classic Betty Crocker's cookie book, cookie with a Y, right? That's one of the later incarnations of that spelling. Um, so the 1940s, World War II was a great homogenizer of foodways. Uh, we are starting to lose our regional foodways in the 20s and 30s. Um, so we're getting a more homogenous uh, American foodway, which in a lot of instances really means, you know, white Yankee New Englander <laughs> foodways. Um, but the U.S. government asks people to send boxes of Christmas cookies to the troops during World War II. And so that kind of popularizes the idea of Christmas cookies along a wide, for a wide swath of Americans, right? Um, in the 50s and 60s, a huge number of Christmas themed cookbooks, um, cookbooks, party books, craft books, those are all published in the 50s and 60s that become hugely popular. And then also in the 50s and 60s, there's a real interest in connecting or reconnecting um, to immigrant foodways, and then also post-war European food traditions. A bunch of books are being published post-war about like European peasant foods, about um, immigrant traditions in the United States. For a lot of immigrant people, they're like third generation by the 1950s and 60s. A lot of people are second generation, but starting in the 50s and 60s, we start to get third generation, usually in immigrant communities, it's the third generation. First generation has the culture and is trying to assimilate. Second generation rejects their parents' culture and really tries to assimilate. Third generation is like, hey, 
we don't we're losing that we want to go back and try and reclaim some of that heritage so you get that a lot also with Christmas and holiday foods are one of the most common ways that immigrant communities express their culture um, across, you know, decades or even centuries of immigrant um, immigration. So what's the future of Christmas cookies, right? Not, could be super bright, could be not super bright, depending on your perspective. So we have all of these dietary restrictions now that are preventing people maybe from consuming Christmas cookies. Cookies are ubiquitous. You can buy cookies anytime you want at a 24-hour gas station or a sea store, right? You don't have to make your own. They're everywhere. So should we keep making them at home? We even have the proliferation of artisan Christmas cookies. I now know um, multiple people who have made businesses, full-time businesses for themselves just on making fancy decorated cookies and selling them. And then we kind of have this decline in cookie swaps, right? People who spend a lot of time making beautiful, delicious, traditional Christmas cookies then have to swap with people who are like, hey, I bought this box of store-bought cookies or hey, here's the slice and bake cookies that I, I made, right? So there's this kind of disconnect between who values Christmas cookies and who doesn't. Diet culture ruins everything. Boo, diet culture. <laughs> Eat the cookies. That's one time a year. Um, and then there's people who are like, how are these traditions serving me? Do we need to keep them? Right? Do we need to keep cookies as a tradition? It's a valid question. Um, so who knows? what the future holds for Christmas cookies. They're a food culture, so they'll probably continue to persist like they have since medieval Europe or even earlier. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where they go in the future. So that is the end of my talk. And we can open the floor for questions. I see there's probably a couple in the chat. Yeah, it looks um, like I'm seeing a couple in the chat right now. Um, yeah. Where are we at? Um, isn't, okay, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce that. Isn't Sepernus and Mexican wedding cookies very close or the same? Not really. Um, they're similarly shaped uh, and some Sepernus are frosted, um, but they're very different flavor profiles. Uh, so they might have a similar shape and texture, but I think, you know, it's kind of like which came first you know, Chinese dumplings or ravioli, you know, <laughs> very separate, disparate things that maybe might be related to each other, but probably not. Um, uh, yeah, Mexican, because Fafranusa do sometimes have almonds in them, but it's the spice flavor profile and the Mexican wedding cookies, the nuts are the foremost flavor profile. And that the, really the thing that distinguishes them is the powdered sugar being rolled in powdered sugar. Um, so similar, but I, I think, I don't think they're related. Um, and then Vivian has a story. So I'm going to read it for you. She says, my husband and I were gifted a box of these German cookies last year. They are the Ach Achener Printen Christmas cookie, which is a special type of gingerbread that was created in 1820 in the city of Aachen. These give an entire economic ability to the town and are only made in a certain time frame of the year, very interesting and flavorful. Cool, yeah, so definitely like Winston-Salem, Moravian cookies are a thing in Winston-Salem, kind of a, a similar a similar vibe going on there. And you're welcome, Denise. I'm glad you enjoyed all the cookie history. Any other questions? I have to say, I thought it was interesting. You sort of unlocked a memory for me when you were going, talking about the Italian cookies. And here, let me see. Okay, there, you can see me now. <laughs> when you were talking about the Italian cookies, I remember when I was a kid, my grandma and grandpa would make tadals. And I always thought they looked like these delicious sugar cookies. And I'd bite into them and it was anise every time. <laughs> and every year I was like, oh, they're like sugar cookies. I take a bite and I was like, oh, <laughs> I hated it as a kid. I just, But every year I thought they looked so delicious. I had to try them. <laughs> I know that's like when you see the the um, Agnetti, right? They're like little round, 
sugar cooking it with like this frosting and the sprinkles and they look so cakey and delicious and then you bite into them and they're anise flavored yeah I, I think that's what they are i think we just called them to dolls because i think it's a regional thing yeah but probably. it's an anise cookie and it's like and it almost looks like it's in the shape of like a like a twisted donut a little bit oh then, yes yeah. i've seen those yeah yep yes we have Very those similar. and then um pizzelles we make those every year and yeah, really good on almond or anise, which now I like the flavor of because you know. I'm oh a, yeah, I'm not five. Like, <laughs> yeah, the anise, the caraway, like the citron. You know, you're like, uh, uh nope. But then as nope. an adult, you come to appreciate them a little better. So <laughs> that is a. I'm so happy that that unlocked that memory for you. That's a great. I know. Thing. I was true. I just I, it was yeah. I kind of I wish they were still around to make them because I I would probably eat them now. <laughs> well you'll have to see if you can find a recipe yeah I mean I would I'd be interested in trying them my sister makes the pizzelles now and they're delicious she gave me some at her house and I ate the, all of them on the ride home my husband didn't get any <laughs> they were, yeah, they were too good I've made spits because I'm cookie press I've made uh, I made zonbuckles for the first time this year because I got a bunch of tins from my mom they're so easy and I have a from caca iron and I have not yet like figured out like it takes a while right to make those so i haven't done it yet but i've got the iron i've got the little special cones they're so pretty though hmm? they're so pretty they are and so i grew up with you know lots of elderly scandinavian ladies we were in a swedish society we were in the sons of norway so we'd go to all these christmas things where it'd be like potluck cookie time basically and um, people would make rosettes, which I didn't even talk about. That's another fried Scandinavian cookie. But the krimkaka, some people made them so thin and they were so delicate that they would like crumple up um, wax paper in the in the box and like put oh. them in layers to keep them from breaking. Oh wow! This other they're so they're much thinner. Like pizzles, sometimes they break, but they're pretty sturdy usually, especially yeah. if you like keep them in an in a nice box so they're not like jostling all over the place um mm -hmm. but cream caca is like can you drop that box no forget it all of those, <laughs> all of those nicely rolled cream caca that the woman spent hours on done oh, shattered they yeah. were just little pieces so <laughs> it's interesting stuff yep. anyway oh well you know i'm not seeing any more questions but uh we had a lot of good feedback that said vivian said excellent presentation thank you we got well thanks nice everybody for from... joining yeah, look at this. This is great. Well, you know, thank you everybody who joined us tonight and thank you to the friends. Um, I was really excited about this program. Really anything that has to do with food and history, I am on board for. And if you are also as obsessed with food and history as I am, you will definitely want to go to Sarah's website, which is thefoodhistorian.com. Yeah, it's the Lots gateway of history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, I you, I think we are good. Everybody have a lovely night and a lovely holiday. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.